So we've seen that the electric field is related to the force on a charged particle and its charge through E is equal to F divided by Q. So this tells us that if we put a charged particle into an electric field, it's going to feel a force and that force is given by F is equal to EQ. So let's have a think about a really easy example. Imagine that we put an electron into an electric field which was going up the screen with a magnitude of one newton per coulomb. So in that case, the force felt by the electron will give it, be given by E times Q. So that is equal to one times 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, as that's the charge on an electron. Well, it's got the negative sign, but we can think about the negative sign when we think about the direction rather than including it in that um, equation there. And so obviously when we do this multiplication, we end up with 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 newtons. And when we think about the direction, if the electric field is going up the screen, then the force on an electron, which is a negative particle, is going to be down the screen, as the electric field lines show the direction of the force on a positive particle. So I've got a couple of demos to show you of charged particles in electric fields. So what we've got here is a cathode ray tube. So cathode rays are just electrons. They were called cathode rays initially because it wasn't realized that they were electrons until later. And in here, I've got a couple of plates which I'm going to apply a voltage across. And when I do that, I generate an electric field. So in this case, it's the same as the example we've just talked about. I'm going to have an electric field going up from the lower plate to the upper plate, and I'm going to be shooting electrons through that electric field. So let's have a look at what happens when I do that. Okay, let's turn on the cathode rays. So there they are, there's no electric field at the moment. Now I'm going to switch on the voltage between those two little plates. So now I can adjust the voltage with this knob here. And you can see as I increase the voltage, the cathode rays are deflected. And that's because they feel the force between these two plates here. And you can see that there is a voltage between these two plates because every now and then it sparks. So that's what happens when the, the voltage gets high enough. We ionize the air in between them and then electrons jump from the top plate to the bottom plate. Now, the second example is a more everyday example. I've got a candle here. Now, the flame of a candle actually consists of somewhat ionized air. So the flame actually consists of charged particles. And I've put the candle between two metal plates, which are now connected across a voltage source. So when I turn the voltage source on, it's an alternating voltage source. So that will generate an electric field between these plates. We'll be learning about this in a later lecture. But the important thing is that there's an electric field between the plates, which is continuously changing direction. So let's have a look at what happens to the candle flame when I turn this on. So you can see when it's turned on, the candle flame spreads out because the charged particles feel the force from the electric field and they're moving backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards like this. Now Robert Andrew Milliken with his graduate student Harvey Fletcher were able to make use of the equation F is equal to EQ to measure the charge on an electron in a series of experiments between 1908 and 1913. This work eventually won Millikan the Nobel Prize in 1923. Now at the time they were conducting their experiments, J.J. Thompson had already completed his experiments where he'd measured the charge to mass ratio of the electron, but neither the charge nor the mass of the electron were known independent of each other. So in their experiment, Millikan and Fletcher released 
oil droplets into a chamber. The oil droplets became charged and were then subject to a variable electric field. And then by carefully measuring the motion of the oil droplets and thinking about the forces which were acting upon them, so there was the electric force from the variable electric field and also the gravitational force of, from the mass of the oil droplets, Millikan and Fletcher realized that the charge on the droplets had to be given by the equation Q is equal to NE, where N is an integer, and they found E to be 1.592 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Now this value of E is very close to the now accepted value of 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs as the charge on an electron. So one very important outcome was the measuring of the size of the charge on an electron. But another important outcome from this experiment was that they'd realized that charge had to be quantized. Now this was not universally accepted at that time before this experiment. So it added a new level to our understanding of the universe. So let's have a look at another problem that we can solve using the equation F is equal to EQ. So the question is, four positively charged particles are traveling to the right in an electric field E directed vertically up the screen. Describe the trajectory of each of the particles. Particle 1 has a mass m and a charge q. Particle 2 has a mass m and a charge 2q. Particle 3 has a mass 2m and a charge q. And particle 4 has a mass 2m and a charge 2q. So to start a problem like this, we should start by drawing a diagram. So here is our electric field going up the screen like this. And here is our charged particle, which is traveling to the right. So it's got some velocity to the right like this. Now we're asked to describe the trajectory. So the trajectory tells us about the motion of the object. So in order to understand the trajectory, we're going to need to know about, well, what's its acceleration equal to? So to get the acceleration, we'll need to consider the forces acting upon our particle. So we know that the force is given by the mass times the acceleration. This is the net force, and this is caused by the electric force. So we've got our electric field lines going up, and we've got some Q times E. This is the size of the electric force. So we can rearrange this to get an expression for the acceleration of the particle. It's given by QE on M where Q means the charge on the particle and M means the mass of the particle. So let's look at the acceleration of each of these particles individually. So A1 is going to be, we've got mass M and charge Q. So this is just going to be QE on M. A2, in this case, we've got a charge of 2Q. So this will be 2QE and the mass is still M. For particle 3, we've got a mass of 2m and a charge q. So this is going to be equal to qe divided by 2m. And a4, we've got a mass 2m and a charge 2q. So this will be 2qe on 2m. So those 2s will cancel and we'll end up with qe on m. So from this, we can see, well, a2 is the biggest. It's got the biggest acceleration. And then a1 and a4 are the same. And then a3 has got the smallest acceleration, which isn't surprising. It's the heaviest um, with the same mass as particle 1. Okay, so if we want to draw trajectories for these then they're going to be accelerated upwards because they're positive particles so they move in the same direction as the electric field so a2 um, well particle 2 is going to bend the most when it gets into the field so it's going to bend up like this it will still keep some horizontal component but it will have an ever increasing vertical component so let's call that um, 2 
and then um, we've got particle one and four will accelerate the same amount so they're going to bend up like this so that is one and four and then we've got particle three with the least acceleration so it bends even more slowly so that's particle three now because in all these cases the acceleration is up the page while the velocity is along the page i.e the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity these are each going to follow parabolic trajectories just like projectile motion so we can say the paths will be parabolas